For our final panel of the day, we have 2020 Grammy winning producer of the year, ASCAP Vanguard Award and co-writer and producer of pretty much every song released by his sister, Billie Eilish. It's Phineas O'Connell in conversation with one of his creative idols, Oscar and Tony winning songwriter, Glenn Hansard, moderated by Billboard's Tatiana Sarasano. So there's no time to waste, guys. Let's start the conversation. Hi, Tatiana. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you guys doing? I'm great, good. thank you. you, Glenn. Good? Great. Really good here. Thank you. It's great, <laughs> to, uh, great to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that true? I know. Um, thank you both for being here. I'm so excited to get to talk to you. And as Crystal said, we, we do have no time to waste, and I, I have tons that I want to ask you. So I'll just jump into it if that, um, works, if that works for you guys. Um, so you, you two have a lot of things in common, um, which we'll, we'll sort of go over today. Um, but one of them is that you're both of Irish descent. Well, and I know that you're actually in Ireland right now. Um, did you guys listen to Irish music growing up? Is that part of your, has that culture influenced your music at all? I'm curious. You go first, Glenn. <laughs> okay. Well, well, for me, that's an easier one to answer because in Ireland, you know, everybody sings songs around the table. You know, it's a... It's a kind of a natural occurrence that, that you know, when, when your, your dad and mom would arrive home from the bar late on a Saturday night, they might bring all their friends. And next thing you know, you've got this kind of, you know, session going on. And so I grew up kind of sitting at the table listening to, you know, what, what I would describe as my drunkles uh, singing, uh, you know, Irish ballads. And, and, and so, so absolutely, I'm steeped in it. But I'd be very curious to hear about Phineas. Um, I mean, I, I feel like a, a little bit of a phony, you know, saying that I'm of Irish descent, even though I, I am in terms of my grandparents and great grandparents. I think just like I didn't manage to get out to Ireland until last summer when we were on tour. So it was always like a dream of mine to go to Ireland, but I never felt like it was attainable um, just because we grew up not being able to afford to go almost anywhere. But we did grow up on, on you know, a fair amount of... Uh, Irish music, but I don't think there was ever a, um, when I think back to it, it wasn't like we were listening to you 2 because of how Irish it was, or we were listening to, to you, Glenn, or Damien, because of, because of the Irish heritage. It was just like the music that I loved, and I was listening to it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. what other music did you grow up on, Phineas? Um, I mean, I grew up on um, sort of like a, a combo. I, I grew up in the... Uh, sorry to say it on an ASCAP panel, but I grew up in the LimeWire era of like <laughs> pirated music. And my 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 dad, to throw him under the bus, philosophically was like, "Listen, I bought all of these albums on vinyl, and then I bought them all on CD, and now I am downloading them on, on LimeWire." Um, <laughs> LimeWire is gone, so I, I'm I'm allowed to say all of this. Anyway, it was sort of a combo platter of like the music that it influenced and shaped them and then the music that we had kind of like Billy and I, you know, introduced into their lives. Um, growing up, I was a huge uh, Ben Folds fan and uh, a huge sort of fan of like the, the wave of like 2000s American bands like My Chemical Romance and Green Day. And, um, yeah, it was a sort of a like uh, eclectic group of music. I think that like the number one artist that we grew up listening to is just like the Beatles at, at every turn. Um, but sort of branching off from that, like my mom's been obsessed with Pink Floyd and Simon and Garfunkel my whole life. My dad's been obsessed with like King Crimson and Yes. Um, and so those were kind of like uh, the additional color palettes in terms of what we were listening to. Yeah. Um, do you each remember the first song that you wrote? Ooh, go, go, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I remember I wrote a song for my grandmother, uh, and it was all about getting old, and I, I can relate to it. She was probably younger than I am now when I wrote it. And, and, you know, I was like, sitting in this lonely place, not recognizing any face. You turn and take one more pace, stare into that empty space where you used to lie. So I used to dance. So it's like you can totally see where I'm going. Like I'm just literally taking one rhyme and just repeating that rhyme over and over and over. Uh, so it, it's it's interesting to kind of go back to that to that first song and sort of see you know 
because I just, I, I mean, I just, I grew up on Dylan and, and Leonard and, you know, and they were kind of my, they were the, they were the, my gods. And so for me, I never really thought about being a songwriter. I just wanted to do what they were doing and they were writing songs. So I, I guess I just followed suit. How old were you? Uh, I would have been about 12 when I wrote that. Ah. Pretty good for a 12 year old's first song, I would say. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I, when I, it's funny because I pulled it out a few, a few weeks ago just because someone asked me about my first song and I was actually able to remember every word. So I think that says something, That's even though so what, it, what it says is that what it says is that I emotionally was telling something true because the word stayed with me. Otherwise, if, if I was just rhyming, then it wouldn't matter. Wow. That's, That's awesome. I was, I was 11, 11, 12 when I started writing songs to, um, they, they, did not remain profound to me, um, but uh, you know, I mean, it, that was just sort of like trying to, like the way that I've always put it is like, I don't, I don't think you could call the songs that I was writing at the beginning of my life uh, good per se, or quantifiably good. But I've always written like very structurally sound songs. Like they always have like a big fat chorus and a, ver a verse that you can sing along to and you know, you know when the bridge is the bridge, and you know what the post like it's very like looks like a like even if it's like a ugly house color, like a like a poorly painted house, like the the beams are all in the right place of the house. Yeah. <laughs> which is so which is so important. You can't have a house without the structure, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean there are great songs that have very atypical structures and sometimes like the songs that I love have have, you know, odd atypical structures, but um yeah, I think that was like very important to me growing up was to sort of like uh, writing material that felt uh, stable. Mm -hmm. it felt like you could you could teach it to your three mates and they would uh, learn how to play it, play it in the garage. Yeah. What I was doing at that age too. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, and I know that you're both also fans of one another's work. Um, so, what do you think that you have in common as artists, or not? And what do you appreciate about each other's work? Um, I appreciate about Glenn's work, um, I mean, so many things. I feel like, to me, there's, Glenn has a, a large catalog, and, and I, I don't want to, I always feel frustrated when people sum people up in terms of, like, a couple songs they're going to reference. So Glenn does many things beyond this. But one of the things that I always took note in of Glenn's work was, was this ability to be, uh, wonderfully ambiguous in very specific terms. Like he'd write this song that like, I'm sure meant, you know, one thing to Glenn and to me was able to like, I was able to like jigsaw that song into like my own life and just like have that tell my story to me when I was driving around listening to it in my car. Um, and I feel like that's always something that I've been inspired by and sort of tried to do is like, write a song that may be very personal and professional to me that someone else can, can interpret totally differently, which to me, like a song like The Moon or Say It To Me Now or um, uh, When Your Mind's Made Up, like when I was, those are the songs that I was first like introduced to of Glenn's work when I was like 12, 13, and those songs all did that to me. Oh, thanks, Phineas. That's so kind of you. I mean, it, it, it is true to say, to talk, to speak about that idea of, you know, Building a song in in in, in loose in looser structure that people can take what they want from it. I think that's really important. And um, you know, when I heard a, a writer say that that the more specific you get, the more absolutely, the more the more specific you get in anything, the more truthful you get, and the more you distill and distill down, the more universal it becomes. I love that. Yeah, so if you get really, really personal, like really speak to exactly what you're saying, and sometimes even use a name or use a phrase that someone uses, that actually don't be afraid of not being understood because it'll actually be understood on a more abstract level, on a more mm -hmm. spiritual, whatever way. That, but, you know, I mean, for me, like your song, Die Alone, is uh, it's just it's one of those songs that I, you know, if that was the first song in your record, I'd be like, I'm like straight, I'm like, I, I want, you know, it's because a song is all about, you know, when you hear it, it's all about pulling you in. There has to be something about it that just pulls you to a place, you know, and that song really does that for me. And I love the uh, the intimacy of it. And I love, and, I, and of course, I love the, uh, 
the way you build it, like you say, the beams and the the architecture, if you like, yeah. is uh, so really much. powerful. Somewhere on YouTube, there is a the day that I wrote that song. I, I played a show that night, and I had written that song in a green room uh, backstage at a, a venue, and I think. Texas and um, and it was very it was very like the 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 first uh, batch of your music that I was introduced to was a very like st sort of strummy angry guitar song that I eventually parsed down into a piano ballad but for a while it was a, it was a lot of really loud acoustic guitar I'll send that to you nice song. I'd like to very Glenn, very Glenn Hansard <laughs> I thought it was very Damien Royce but then he told me today that it was that it was me. <laughs> um, and I just want to say for anybody watching, um, some of us are having a few Wi-Fi difficulties, so um, if you can't see us or hear us, um, that might be why, but we are still here. Um, so, so yeah, just so that you know, it's not an error. <laughs> um, just close your eyes and listen to it like wow. an audiobook or a podcast, a podcast. any other uh, a, a visual meeting. meeting. Yeah. Medium. This is like a phone call you shouldn't be listening to. Exactly. <laughs> That's, yes, exactly that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I know that you both also kind of had these moments where you blew up in the spotlight at a really young age. Um, Phineas, I mean, kind of still with the success of When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go, and all of your other um, accolades, um, and then also Glenn through your role in Once. Um, so how has, how did having that kind of huge success at an early age um, impact you and impact your approach to whatever came next? Well, that's a good Please. question. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, listen, I, not, not disregarding how lucky I've been, but it's like all of the things that I've gotten to do in terms of like producing albums and, and going on world tours, those were all my lifelong dream from the time I was like 11 years old. So even though I like am, am young in terms of like the, you know, human lifespan uh, as a 22 year old, like it still feels like a decade long yeah. aspiration. Um, and so that's, that's just great. Like, I think that just makes me feel very lucky and I, I feel a great sense of like fulfillment from that. And, um, you know, I think that the thing that I always hoped for in terms of like an abstract goal was I always wanted to be able to not have another job and just have music be my uh, job. Um, and I think that's kind of, I've never redefined my, my hope and my expectations. So I think as long as I remain able to just write and produce music for people and have that in my bills, like I'll, I'll always deem my life as a success. Um, and everything else is kind of just a, like the the bonus level when you go down the pipe in Mario and you get to the level where there's just like all the, all the boxes you can jump on and like and it's just it's just like a time trial level like that that's how it feels now just like this is just a cool like Easter egg because um, yeah I, I really mean that I felt like as soon as I I think as soon as I bought like a computer off of like money that I had made from making a song on my computer, I was like, I'm done. I did it. I've, uh, I'm, I'm as successful as I ever hoped I would be. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, um, and Glenn, I want to hear what you have to say too. Um, but Phineas, I know we've also spoken before about like, there's, there can be a frustration with people saying like someone is an overnight success when you've obviously been working at it for like a decade. Um, so that's an interesting point that you brought up too, I think. Well, it's interesting, Phineas, when you speak about, you know, going from 12 to 22, right, which is where you are now. For right. me, you know, for me, 12 to 22 was another very interesting journey. And like you say, you're, it's almost like you're, um, you're, imagine, you're imagining your life into being, you're imagining your future, and you're actually willing it. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people put, put a lot down to talent. But actually, there's a huge amount that I, I would ascribe to will. I think if you're somebody who has a strong will, like if you're just like... And you know you could use the term driven, but if you just have it, if you can, if you can dream hard, you can achieve. Uh, you know, and I know that that's very kind of a bit esoteric or whatever to say, but actually, I found it to be true for myself. I mean, you know, I was a massive Bob Dylan fan, for instance. You know, I, I, and he was kind of my first musical love. Um, and it took between, I suppose, thirteen, which is when I discovered him, 
between 13 and 23 for me to actually meet him. Now, I, now I know that that sounds a bit name droppy. I'm not. I don't mean it to sound like that. What I'm trying to say is that every bit of your body sets sail towards a destination, and that destination might be that, like you say, Phineas, to play on a big stage or to produce a record or to buy your first laptop off the money you made. For me, at 13, when I first went on to Grafton Street and I took out my guitar, when I pulled my guitar out of my guitar case, I was declaring myself a musician. It was a huge feat. And I took it and I played my first song and I remember someone threw in 20p. And like you, Phineas, I walked to the first cafe and I bought a cup of tea, but that cup of tea was the best cup of tea I ever drank because I, I earned it out of music. And I've pretty much had this attitude ever since that any money I've ever earned in, in true music, I kind of consider it to be glowing. Like it's, it's come through art. Nobody's gotten hurt by this. It's come through the work of, of, of the imagination. And I find it really, uh, really, really powerful. So I, I completely relate to that. And, and, you know, there was a moment for me, I was in The Commitments when I was 21. This film it was a film uh, by Alan Parker. And I remember the success of that. I really rejected the success of it. And I got really afraid and I kind of was really embarrassed. And then when once happened, I was 35 when once happened, and I was so ready for it because I had kind of, I felt like I'd rejected it the first time and then I'd spent the whole time hoping it would happen again. And then when lightning in a bottle happened twice, I was so ready and so ready to embrace it and so ready to enjoy it. I still had awkward feelings. And it's funny, when I, when I met you, Phineas, um, at the Electric Picnic, a festival here in Ireland during the summer, I was so pleased to meet you, but I, but I recognized something, and I, and I hope that I don't, I hope I'm not making a, hope I'm not making a, a kind of an unfair uh, judgment at all. I, I don't mean it, but I recognized an exhaustion in you. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, but I mean this, and because you guys were you guys were on fire, you know, the gig was amazing, and but I was in a band with Marquetta from once, and yeah. we when when we had that moment after the Oscars, we just. We worked so so hard, and I, I noticed that you guys um, were. I noticed you guys were working so hard at that time, and I recognized an exhaustion between you two as a as a creative pair that I knew from myself and Marquetta. Now it's not a bad thing or a negative thing; it's a really beautiful thing. It's almost like a camaraderie, like two soldiers, you know. Um, yeah, it was lovely to witness that and to feel that, and I knew it. I I I felt that feeling backstage. I think it's the same. For me, especially because I met you right after we got off stage, um, I think when you, like, the way that I remember feeling, and it's a satisfying way, is like you have, uh, you have nothing left, but it's only because you, like, you gave it, like, everything you had. And I think that that's how I felt at the end of, like, every show that I've loved in my life. It's like, oh, I've got nothing else to give. <laughs> and then you guys were jumping on a plane to Milan to do another show, and then you were coming back to Ireland the next day. So, I mean, I, I was because I was in the middle of a kind of a holiday period, and, and to see you guys working so hard was really amazing. It was awesome. Well, that's very sweet of you. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I, I think it is like that. I love that you, you brought it to Will um, because I, yeah, inexplicably in my life, I feel that this the same exact way. I feel like everything that I sort of pointed my like heart and my like just uh, uh, like not even not even ambition, but just like desire toward as like a 11, 12 year old, like whenever that kind of like materializes in your life, you're like, wow, this is this is very strange and bizarre. I mean, just like meeting you, you know, I've gotten to meet to meet a lot of people now that i that really you know completely shaped you know what i wanted to do with my life and the kind of music that i was interested in making and the idea that you can kind of like like design your path to intersect with someone else's path is like very exciting and inspiring to me and i, I you know i've obviously seen other people do it in their lives so anytime i get to to do something like that like meet you after a show um, there's a band I've loved for a long time called the Airborne Toxic Event. Mikkel, who's the lead singer of that, is a like we've become friends. I think any time that anything like that happens, you have this feeling of like, well, this is this. The odds of this are very low in terms of kind of like just abstract odds, like like the age gap and the the sort of period of life that you were living through. It's all very the odds are low. So when it all happens, it's very exciting. Well, can I speak to that for a second? Just because, just because Daniel's here and he's in the next room, I just there's a very interesting thing that happened with me 
Um, and this really speaks to what you're saying, Phineas. I was on tour with Damien. Damien had released O, and Damien brought the frames. I've never seen places like, you know, Beacon or Radio City or, you know, the Wiltern. I'd never seen them. And it was only when I saw those places and I was able to give my affection a target. And I was able to sort of go, wow, these rooms are amazing. Yeah. That within, yeah. within two years of that tour, we were playing those rooms. Mm. And it was only, because, it was only until, I, until I could see what I was looking for that the universe went click, click, click. Like you say, the chances of you meeting these people with age gaps and all. So what does the universe have to do to get you to get to that spot? It has to create this thing called Billie Eilish and Phineas and you end up having to hold this. And they, basically the, 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 the universe ends up being creative on your behalf, if that, make, if that makes sense. To, to go off on, just to go off on that particular tangent for a moment. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I feel like I put a lot of uh, emphasis on, on luck in my own life because I, I witness talented friends of mine experience like less like success on paper than I feel that I've experienced. I don't want to discredit their abilities or talent, but yeah, I think will, will and luck are both kind of like, uh, they're, they're cousins maybe, um, get, get lucky and you have a really strong will do a lot of stuff. How do you work? You look here, you get, <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean, speaking of like exhaustion, is there anything that you do, either of you, to kind of make sure that you don't get burnt out when you're on tour, when you're when you're promoting an album, things like that? Uh, well, I, I'll answer that quickly. No is the answer. <laughs> and not for me. I don't have anything that saves me from that. And and sometimes. I break through to a level of exhaustion where where the gigs just get really really good <laughs> because you are just so empty and so this the critic the critic gets out of the way and you just manage to go out there so because you know at, when you're on tour Phineas you know about this when you're on tour all that matters is that two hours or that hour and a half or whatever it is all that matters is that 90 minutes and so your whole day is a is a meditation leading up to a moment and then everything that happens after that moment is not important either. So you become almost like your days become this kind of strange meditation towards a thing. Would you agree? I, I almost agree. I have taken it upon myself to, to punish myself by making albums and EPs the whole time I tour now. Um, so in my case, it's, it's not that way anymore. It was at the beginning when we were playing really tiny tours and we were in in a van um and we didn't have any like room to go it was like that it was sort of zen and you set up all your own stuff and you go to the green room and have a bite to eat and walk back on stage and power everything on turn all your amps on and then start playing the show and then you'd go to bed and it was the whole day was laser focused on the on that but as uh as our crew expanded and we started playing bigger venues we you know accumulated uh, roadies and guitar techs and um, I no longer had the kind of meditative like coiling of cables around my hand for an hour or two every day and so as a coping mechanism I was like well I'm just gonna start making uh, music on the road and so there I mean I can point to instances like for instance we were on um, we were on tour in Texas during Austin City Limits in October of 19 and I I thought, I bet I could write, I bet we could write this James Bond theme this week. And so that entire week, we were playing a show every night and I was up until the moment I had to put on my like white sweatsuit to go get on stage. I was like working on the, the vocal or the piano or the synthesizer. And then I would go on stage and we'd play the show and I'd get off stage and shower and go right back to working on the song, um, which is a, is a little bit exhausting. And I don't, I don't think I could necessarily do that if I were in Billy's position playing these shows or, or your position playing these shows. Um, you know, in Billy's show, I'm, I have a, 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 the best time of my life, but I'm, you know, I'm servicing her show and providing support for her on stage. I'm not having to uh, necessarily like fully 
just drain myself engaging with every uh, audience member in the building. I'm, I'm focused on playing my part really well and performing, you know, uh, energetically and, and being, uh, you know, stable for Billy to perform on top of. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's touring's a funny thing, man. I, yeah, I get really, really fried touring. There, the uh, the forced hiatus that every touring musician is currently on because of COVID. Um, other than the overwhelming sort of like empathy crisis I have of like feeling nervous and concerned and feeling the heartbreak of like everyone suffering because of this, the kind of day to day reality of getting to wake up and make myself a cup of coffee and write songs all day um, has been sublime. Yeah, we actually, um, a viewer had a question that kind of relates to that. Um, so I want to shout out Kira is wondering, um, how is working on music been different in quarantine than on tour? Um, music, working in quarantine, I, you know, uh, Billy and I still, we're, we're part of the same like quarantine bubble. So she uh, lives at a different house than me, but we see each other almost every day and work on music. Um, and you know, she, she's like the only person I actually see and spend time with. Um, so we work together the same way we always have. And then other, uh, projects I've worked on, uh, like the Ben flat record that came out recently, the Celeste record that came out recently. Those have just been like totally remote operations. I just get sent a vocal and a piano part and I produce everything around it and send it back to them and get feedback, record the feedback. Um, so that's been, that's been fun and engaging too. I mean, it's all, you know, the, the era of the home producer has been, you know, advantageous for, for, uh, quarantine living. How do you, how do you feel? I, right before we started this call, Glenn, you were saying that you only started writing a bunch of music during quarantine when you, when you gave yourself no pressure to write a bunch of music. Yeah, Phineas, I took, I took the year off this year uh, on the advice of a friend last year, actually a friend who's, uh, who's very, very connected with astrology uh, and very interested in astrology. He said, listen, if you ever want to take a year off, let it be next year because next year is a write-off. <laughs> when did he say this? I know, he said this to me last August. Oh my God. He said, next year is a write-off. He said, I don't know exactly what it is, but... And he actually, he made a very interesting point. Now, I'm, go, I'm going off for one now, but it's lovely. He had a beautiful man, Andrew Smith. He, uh, but he, he said that, he said, uh, next year the feminine will speak. This was his kind of, this was what he said. He said, the feminine is about to speak. And when it speaks, it's going to speak loud and clear. Everybody, everybody's going to have to stay home. Everybody's going to have to reflect. Everyone's going to have to. And he was like, he, he was spot on. I called him a couple of weeks ago and I was like, my God. He said, listen, isn't she speaking? And I said, gee, it's incredible. But anyway, so I, so I took the year off on his advice. And um, plus I was pretty wrecked, you know, and, and I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to, um, you know, I just wanted to, 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 I wanted to kind of get back to my song. But uh, I took the year off and I decided not to give myself any pressure. And when all of this began with the, the lockdown and stuff, my, like, you, like you said, Phineas, I was just thinking about friends and family and, making a lot of phone calls, checking in with people, feeling really concerned for everyone I knew. And it was only after that, that then songs began to kind of just kind of tipple out. And then there was a bit of a flood. And I just was kind of having, no, I don't know if they're any good. And that's not important. What's important is that you just kind of, that you just kind of go at it and you just sort of, what's that? Throw that out. What's this? What, you know, so I think I've probably got a lot of ideas. You know, yeah. I wouldn't, I don't know about song. Song might be a bit, a bit too early just to use that word. You know, but lots of stuff coming. You know. Yeah, I've been writing. I've been writing a lot too, and I and and trying not to worry about uh, quality at all. Just been writing everything, and yeah. uh, and it, sometimes sometimes a couple of days later, I go, "That was I like that. That's still I still like that song." And some days I go, "Oh well, there there's one line in there that's good." But yeah, I've I've been, been in the same boat. I've been writing actually far more during quarantine than I have in the last. 12 month period in terms of like consistency. Can I ask you a question, Phineas, about all of this? Did you, sure. find, did you find, for instance, when you were writing the Bond song, did you find that it was easier to write a song from the perspective of a character that's, or a song that's about to be used in it? Because, you know, then it's less personal. Because I yeah. found with Once, you know, when we, when we wrote those songs, myself and Marquetta, 
we were just really buzzing off these characters that we were playing. And we were kind of, writing the, we were, even though the songs were personal, we were writing to characters. And actually it ended up being really good work as a result, only, only because the critic got out of the way. And yep. we could just write these songs without, kind of, without thinking too hard about them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I, uh, I was actually going to ask you about that. I've, I've seen interviews of you prior, so I, know that, I knew that some of the... But say it to me, there are a couple songs in Once that, are, that were not written because of Once the movie, Absolutely. right? There are a couple, yeah, right? I think I was older, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the Bond song, here's, here's what I will say. I, like, the Bond song uh, posed its own, uh, you know, sort of level of, of challenges. Um, but I think the fun part about writing kind of assignment songs, which is what I'll call like a bomb song or like Billy and I are working on something else right now or we're having to write songs that are not from either of our own perspectives. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's easier to quantify whether you've nailed them or not, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, I feel like I remember like closing my computer when we'd finished recording all of um, No Time to Die. And I remember being like, well, that's, you know, that's the song. And, um, and sometimes when you're writing just a kind of an abstract uh, diary entry of your own life, yeah. you're, like, you're like, well, that, that is a song about this one experience, but maybe I'll write another song about that same experience tomorrow. And that'll be, you know, there's a kind of a, it's more ambiguous. I think when you're doing this kind of assignment process, it is sometimes faster and, 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 like more fun. Like I have more fun. I feel like I would, uh, I haven't done it. So I'm not pretending I have, but I would, I would love to write some musicals because I would love to just write songs yeah. from the perspective of someone that's totally not me. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. And can I have another question for you? Sure. I'm sorry, Tatiana. Can, can I ask no, one more question? Please, please go ahead. And um, I'm just really curious about when you work with Billy, because this is something yeah. that when I listen to those records, I, I, I'm guessing that there's an awful lot of quality, like there's an awful lot of quality control. I'm guessing there's an awful lot of, it's not good enough ready. It's not ready yet. It's not good enough. That's, do I, you know, do I believe this character? I, I would imagine that there's an awful lot of, you know, really looking at it and really criticizing it before you're ready to release it. Does that, does that make sense? But maybe I'm wrong. No, you're right. It's very, um, the, the overhead, is like virtually non-existent like for for every five songs that we put out there were there were five songs being written you know what i mean there's there is sort of there's no kind of uh what what you and i are talking about uh both of us doing during quarantine of like writing songs willy nilly um i don't do any of that with them we write one song and we puzzle over it and we just attack it from all angles and when it's done it's done and if we never finish it, we never finished it. And um, yeah, it's very, it's very meticulous. It can be uh, quite um, draining, but but it's you know I I love the result of it, so I, I'll never get tired of doing it. But yeah, it's definitely it's a very unique process. I've like we we really never write. Uh, we're much more likely to just write nothing one day than to write something and both of us be like, yeah, I don't know, like I don't know about that one. Like yeah. it's just much, yeah. It's an interesting process. I think it's because it's the the two of us. I remember hearing an interview of yours on something like NPR or KCRW, probably back in two thousand seventeen, where you were talking about um, you, you just put out an album and you were saying that in the middle of the album, your producer or collaborator had come to you and said something to the effect of like this just isn't good enough, and you had to like restart. Um, yeah. And. Uh, I remember hearing that and being like, oh God, because I feel like that's, uh, that's always your fear when you're in the middle of a record. Is, is this good enough at all? Um, and uh, yeah, I think that Billy and I function that way on the, on the daily. You know, I think the, the best example is like, if one of us writes a couple lines for a second verse, the second verse might seem like the sort of least consequential element of the song. You've got an amazing first verse and an amazing pre-chorus and an amazing chorus. Who's going to decide your song is terrible because the second verse doesn't do much? Um, 
And uh, in Billy's case, you know, there this she doesn't think about it that way. You know, if, uh, if it's not interesting enough, she's like, that's not interesting. Yeah. And uh, I love that about her. I think that's one of the yeah. things that makes her great. I do too, and it's, I recognize it because I had the same thing with Marquetta. Marquetta would, would listen to my songs and go, I don't believe that. That's not true. <laughs> and I go, well, it's kind of true. And she'd be like, well, what do you mean it's kind of true? Well, I mean, I'm just being a bit poetic. She said, don't be poetic, be truthful. It's more interesting. And, and she'd say it in a very, and so it ended up making for better songs. And so I was curious about your relationship with Billy in the same way. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's very much a writer in her own right to some degree, but there are, there are instances that I can point to where her incredibly effective um, like role as a, as a songwriter collaborator, and again, this is only in some cases, sometimes she's putting pen to paper and whatever, but sometimes she's, she's at her most effective if I write a whole verse and I sing to her my verse and I bow, and she looks at me and she goes, it needs to be like this. And she just tells me what it needs to be like. And I go, okay. And I go back in and I write it and I go this. And she goes, that's better. And that's like, that's just the kind of like a testament to the different ways that collaboration can still be incredibly instrumental to songs. And, uh, you know, like, there, yeah, there are things that I would never have written if she hadn't said your, your, your first draft of that is not good enough. You need to write it again. Yeah, it's, it's which tough. sometimes can be sometimes can be really annoying because you're like, oh, you you write it, how about? But it really, <laughs> exactly. it's still it's still your onus to go write it, you know. Well, I mean, you know, because you're you're part of you're part of one of the great collaborations, you know, the, the Lennon and McCartneys and the Jaggers, and the, you know, it's the it's that thing of like when when we have a foil, we sometimes can go so much further. It's true. Did you feel that way about Marquetta, and have you felt that way about? Um, like what are the what are the relationships you can point to in your career that have felt that way to you? Where you feel like, you know, maybe a, a contentious creatively, where you, you disagree about stuff, and it and it almost always makes it better. It doesn't you know hurt? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny, and I'm I'm not saying it because he's in the next room, but my 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 relationship with Damien would be very much, you know, we occasionally would get together and play each other songs, and it would be sometimes it's like there's blood all over the floor by the end of it, you know. Because it, and and it's it, but all in the name of getting the thing right, all in the name of of doing it right. But Marquetta was very, like in a way that was kind of how our creative relationship sparked. Because she listened to a song I was writing, and I remember I just sort of going, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. And I was like, wow, because I'd been used to being in a band where I was their songwriter, and that right. was never really disputed, and it was never really, you know, I had like definitely I had friends in my band, Cullum and and Joe were very, they're definitely they would they would have input and they would let me know and they would guide me but but i guess in a way i may have created a bit of a barrier as in like don't come near this you know just and they're, and they're working on the, the great drum part or the great lead guitar line it's less about the lyrics they wrote you know sometimes yeah sometimes whereas marquetta was straight in with the lyrics you know yeah uh, you know and, and and damien the same and so in a way i, I suppose you know yourself and damien have never really never worked together on on songs but we definitely sit down and just talk about songs and talk about each other's songs in a in a very direct way for the sake of the work it sounds like you value as much as i do the the presence in your life of an of another artist who you don't really collaborate with but you're you you share opinions and maybe anecdotes and advice and criticism but, yeah. but it's not a tr traditionally collaborative relationship. I find that the more time I spend in the kind of like air quotes, like music industry, the more I value my like relationships with friends of mine who write great songs and not writing great songs with them, but just playing them my songs and having them play me their songs and telling each other our favorite parts of it and a line that we want to hear earlier in the song, you know, just, just things that, you know, are helpful, but it's, yeah, I, I find, it's, I, I put more and more importance on that, on the relationship it sounds like you have with Damien, where it's, you're not sitting there trying to write a song together for hours. You're saying, listen to the song I wrote. He's telling you how he feels about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really don't want to interrupt you guys, because this is so fascinating, um, but we are running out of time. Um, so just to get in one question um, from our viewers, a lot of people are wondering about um, tips that you have for songwriting. Is there anything that you would want to say? 
I'm really interested to know your tips, Glenn. <laughs> oh God, tips. Um, you know, well, there's a lovely line by, uh, I always come back to this myself, there's a lovely line by Ernest Hemingway. And when he talks about, you know, he says, if you're ever stuck and you, you, you're not writing, just write one true line, something that's absolutely true. And from there, everything will blossom. And I have to say that whenever I've been stuck, that bit of advice has always stayed with me. If I write something that, that I actually, even if it's something that I'm, I'm not really sure I want people to know, but if I even veil it very thinly and I just say it, 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 it brings me to the next part of the song and the next thing I know I'm on flow. That's pretty brilliant. Um, my piece of advice would be um, an extension of like, uh, there's a, I feel like I often hear authors say things to the, to the tune of like, books belong to their readers, right? Or like, you know, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. I think it's really not your job to over-examine or over-analyze the thing that, that you're in the middle of making or that you're about to make. And it's, yeah, I think if I, it's a little bit like Jackson Pollock paintings or something. I think if I did every, if I wrote every line and every melody with like intention and, you know, um, purpose, I think it would all be very mathematical and stale and sort of cold. And I think that the stuff that I'm the most proud of is the stuff that you just kind of like close your eyes and throw a dart at the dartboard and see what happens. And, um, yeah, it's just, I, th I think songs are like yours to write and for others to analyze in a weird way. Um, yeah. That's good advice. You know, I, 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 would, I would concur with that and, and, and add that, um, you, know, that the, 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 you know, the hardest thing with, with writing songs is getting out of your own way. And, mm -hmm. and I would say that, the, the, that just to tr try to remember ideas first, reality later. Don't worry That's about right. a lyric not sitting right. Don't worry about it. Just put it in there. And once, you, once, if it begins to feel like something, then you can go in and edit it later and fix it and pull stuff out and dump stuff. But just don't be precious about it being perfect. Just go in and make something and, and just make something. And once you make something, that'll turn into something else. You know? So true. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phineas. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Tatiana. Also, your psych friend. Oh, my goodness. What a <laughs> for, for knowing what 2020 was going to be. Thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in today.